Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The psalmist writes, I will wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Be patient and wait for the Lord. If there's one thing that's easier to preach than it is to practice, that would be it. Patience. Whatever happened to patience? In a world of on-demand, watch what you want, get what you want right now, we seem to have lost patience with patience. We want it our way, right away. And it really doesn't matter what it is. We want it the way we like it. And we want it right now. Internet service, restaurant service, entertainment, advancements, success, even church. All my way, right away, all the time. We talk on the phone, anywhere and everywhere. Even when Uncle Sam says you're not supposed to, how many people do you see on the road with a hand and a phone glued to their ear? That conversation simply can't wait. And the meals we once enjoyed around the family dinner table at dinner time seem to be a thing of yesteryear. It seems that families are constantly on the go. Nobody has time to get together at home. We eat in our cars on our way to somewhere else. Nobody has time to converse anymore. Instead, we... We chat in little sound bites, we converse in emails, we send text messages, or, I may be showing my age, some people use Twitter and can get everything they want to say into 140 little characters. I don't think there's a pastor on earth that could give you a sermon in 140 characters. And I don't think any of us are actually trying either. We've been blessed with many great advances in technology. But the one thing we don't have, the one thing we seem to have lost in a very short span of time, is our patience. Now in looking at our gospel lesson this morning, we get a glimpse of the devil in action, trying to tempt Christ after his 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Now it's interesting how the devil goes about his business he doesn't come to Christ with blazing pitchforks or threats or fire or brimstone or any of the terrifying images that you might dream up. Instead, he, he comes almost like a, like a kid on the playground, daring Christ to prove his divinity. If you're the Son of God, prove it. Turn these stones to bread. If you're the Son of God, prove it. Throw yourself down off this temple. After all, God has said he's going to command his angels concerning you to guard you, right? On their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot on a stone. But the devil's not exactly a one-trick pony. He then pulls out the slick salesman's speech. Offering Christ the kingdoms of the world. If only you'll do this one small thing. Just, just bow down and worship me. Even if it's just for a little while. Just put your faith and trust in me. Just bow down. I won't tell anyone. But did you notice what the devil is doing in all three temptations? He's trying to derail Christ from the way. Trying to get him to step outside of God's plan for salvation and get instant gratification. 
get everything that He's promised right now the easy way. Hey Jesus, why wait? After 40 days, you're hungry, right? If you really want to, you could just make these stones into bread. And you know, I've been doing some thinking too. If your father really, really loved you and cared for you, well, why would he let you suffer and struggle these 40 days? Well, that's not how I'd act towards someone I loved. Get him to prove his love for you right now then. Jump off this temple and we'll see if he really does care about you. And aren't you tired of being lowly? This is all going to be yours anyhow, right? Why wait? Just bow down, worship. The glory can be yours right now. It's that simple. Now we understand that the devil's temptations are evil. But if we frame these temptations in the context, really, of instant gratification, that hits a little closer to home. That's something we do. But what if Christ had sought a little immediate relief? What if he'd partaken of a little bit of instant gratification? Would that have been such a bad thing? Well, when it comes to God's plan of salvation, yes, that would have been a very, very bad thing. Partaking of the instant gratification that the devil was offering was, for Christ, stepping outside of the Father's plan. And it should come as no surprise that when the devil quoted God's own word in an attempt to convince Christ that his way was a perfectly acceptable shortcut, he did what? He didn't quite quote it right. God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That last little bit, all your ways, is the part that the devil conveniently left out. And to tell a half-truth is nothing less than to tell a whole lie. So I ask you, what is the way of the faithful child of God? Well, simply, it is the way of God. The way of the faithful child of God is the way that follows God Follows his word, his will. Follows his way even when it hurts. Even when it goes against our ways, our wants, our desires. It is the way of faith that trusts in God above all things. Even when the things seem to be at their darkest when they're at their worst. Remember, God's ordered plan of salvation is ultimately recognized in an empty tomb on Easter morning. But you can't get to the empty tomb without traveling through the blood-soaked cross of Calvary. See, the tomb and the cross are two sides of the same coin, the singular coin of salvation. That's God's way. The way of salvation is the way of the cross. And that's what makes this text so important for the first Sunday in Lent. This first Sunday is, in a sense, our spiritual exodus back to Christ's passion. And believe it or not, the text is not really about the temptations in and of themselves. It isn't about a methodology for you that, that you too could replicate when the life and the devil start to tempt you and life starts to get the better of you. What I'm not telling you is just do what Jesus did. You know, sprinkle a little bit of the Jesus method on your problem and poof, problem solved. Now that's how a lot of preachers might proclaim this. Now that isn't right. Because this is not a how-to. Certainly the Word of God is our greatest and most sure defense. But the point of the story is who, who is doing this? Consider, if Jesus Christ, as presented in this gospel lesson, was simply our poster boy for 
how to live and fight the devil and overcome evil, instead of being our perfect and all-fulfilling substitute, well, then that would place us in a very uncomfortable position, the position where we would have to perform at that same level of perfection as Christ Jesus, every single time we battle sin, temptation, and the devil. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly know I don't think I could do it. If it was really that simple, then all it would really have taken is a little little extra us. It wouldn't have taken the death of God himself on the cross just a little more willpower, a little more strength, a little more commitment, a little more faith, a little more of you to see through this veil of tears and into eternity with the Heavenly Father. But it is precisely because of the solo Christo, the Christ alone reality of the atonement, that this particular, particular gospel has traditionally been appointed as the lesson for the first Sunday in Lent, even since the days of the early church fathers. These passages have helped God's people down through the ages as they begin that long Lenten march toward Calvary to refocus their attention on Christ Jesus and all that he gave up for us, to focus on the fact that he came down from heaven for the express purpose of being our perfect, and complete substitute in every manner. Even something so deceivingly simple as trusting in God above all things. Something that we all fail to do. Christ didn't take the shortcut or the quick fix. Those shortcuts we're too often looking for. No, Christ humbled himself. And in perfect, faithful obedience to the Father's word, the Father's will, the Father's way, even knowing what would come. Now, I'm not going to end this sermon with the kind of spiritual pep talk that you might hear, a get-rich-quick kind of way. You know the line. You just got to have faith. Just try harder. I won't do that because that's wrong. Instead, I will leave you with the wonderful gospel truth that proclaims that Jesus Christ did all for you. Precisely because you can't, you couldn't, and you wouldn't anyhow. I leave you with this blunt but necessary truth that there is no shortcut around pain. No shortcut around suffering. No shortcut around temptation as a Christian in this world. There is no other way of tel- to salvation than God's way. And that way, like it or not, includes a cross. A cross that you are to take up daily and follow Christ on his narrow way. In faith, you have to bear a cross. But may the Lord grant you a confident, patient faith all of your remaining days so that in all your ways you may be able to recognize and find true comfort and true peace in the fact that God has promised you good things and good things he has in store for you. Those unbelievably good and heavenly things that Christ has won for you in his death his resurrection, the unbelievably good and heavenly things of which we today take a foretaste in the body and blood of Christ Jesus. Those truly good things come to those who wait patiently and bear their crosses in humble, saving faith. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ.
Christ Jesus. Amen.